Yeah, I think that's a great, great thing to do. All right. So thanks, um, everyone, for for joining and um, and especially our uh, support group here, which is great. So welcome to this um, to this uh, breakout session on bioeconomy for health and well-being. We tried to zero in a bit on um, uh, issues um, and rather than talking about industries as a whole, we tried to focus on this um, issue that issues that have become perhaps more relevant during the past year with this pandemic and with with uh, health and well-being perhaps more in focus um, in as a as a long-term issue. So um, I think we can take the next. Uh, next um, slide. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, in today's session, then we'll um, we'll be um, uh, having a number of, of guest speakers, and uh, then we'll be having discussion. Um, and uh, the um, I don't know if you can see the first slide. Just some teething issues here. Sorry. Sure. 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 <clears throat> Um, actually, what I can do in the meantime is um, introduce our guest speakers, uh, which there'll be a pic picture of them coming up a little bit later. Uh, but we have um, two guest speakers today, um, and their names are Lisbeth de Schurter. She's a researcher in global resource use at the Institute for Ecological Economics, uh, Vienna U University, Economics and Business. Uh, focusing on bioeconomy and food systems in high income regions and uh, sustainability potential of bioeconomy strategies with interdisciplinary uh, approaches from an ecological economics perspective. Um, Professor Tatian Masharabo is a senior lecturer at the uh, University of Burundi, Faculty of Sciences uh, in the Biology Department and Director for Research and Innovation. He's also the team leader for a Bioinnovate project on malaria prevention in Eastern Africa. He's a member of the Burundi National Commission of Science, Technology and Innovation and the governing board of East Africa Science and Technology Commission. Would you mind going back to the previous slide? If yes. So I just wanted to mention our organizing team and particularly our rapporteurs, Lena and Martina. They'll also be making a short intervention uh, today actually. We can, we can take the next. Um, yeah, so um, uh, again, these are the presentations uh, mentioned and uh, followed by a, a presentation on a research design concept. And uh, we'll have questions and discussion and then uh, closing remarks. Go ahead. Um, maybe I can ask my uh, co-chair uh, to come in and uh, mention our guiding questions. Are you there, uh, Nella? Hi, Francis. Yes. Um, yes, go ahead. Yes. And uh, so we have three um, overall guiding questions for this session. And the first one is to try to understand how uh, both uh, at national uh, level and at the regional level, uh, how can we um, use sustainability to harness uh, bioresources, but also uh, using these bioresources to generate value and improve health and well being. And also trying, like, trying to do all the things that the bioeconomy wants to do, which is including uh, preserving biodiversity and maintaining ecosystems. Uh, then the second question is, uh, how uh, can implementation of bioeconomy strategies can enhance uh, synergies between the health of animals, humans, and the um, ecological systems that we depend on? And the third question is around uh, what improvements in policy coherence and institutions are needed for these things to happen. Thanks. Thanks, Nella. Um, we can take the next. Um, so uh, the uh, first presentation then is from Lisbeth and I'm gonna let her go right ahead uh, uh, with, um, with her talk. Uh, Lisbeth, you can turn on your, your camera. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good day, everybody. Uh, thank you, Francis, also for the introduction. Um, thank you all for participating in this session. 
Uh, my, uh, my input presentation is about the need to both curb and promote bioeconomy pathways for health and well-being, and therefore to take um, an integrated supply and demand perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what is an innovative bioeconomy pathway? Um, currently, many countries and regions worldwide are in the process of developing bioeconomy strategies in the context of climate targets, uh, UN SDGs, or as part of a knowledge-based innovation agenda. Um, both in policy documents, the academic literature, and also at practitioner levels, it has been shown that a bioeconomy uh, can indeed provide scope for innovations, uh, massive innovations in the field of health uh, and well-being. Yet, it remains uh, largely unclear what an innovative bioeconomy pathway entails. Um, mostly, or in many cases, it, it takes a, a supply perspective where innovations, where innovations are, are pursued or understood as, as new bio-based businesses or supply chain activities. Um, others um, take a more broader perspective they char characterize the bioeconomy as a renewable economic system as opposed to a more linear system of extraction and waste accumulation. Um, yet that, that is still a, a supply uh, perspective. Um, then uh, planetary boundaries and the need for global governance of natural resources in the bioeconomy are also increasingly emphasized and address the need for, uh, to also take a consumption perspective uh, into account, in particular uh, in high income societies. Um, at the other spectrum, there's a regional perspective where bioeconomy is also considered a development model towards more circular systems, circular bioeconomies, especially in rural economies. Um, and there is the more transformative model of a bioeconomy uh, where pathways um, are, are aiming towards a more healthy planet, uh, the one planet uh, concept and address uh, a different role of economic systems in our society. Um, yeah, when considering all these potential roles and contribution of a bioeconomy, uh, one can ask if, if a bioeconomy is perhaps all of this, or is it at least a pluriform concept huh, that is different in each uh, yeah, ecological context. Um, so far, uh, yeah, one can conclude um, that bioeconomy um, is not only uh, providing solutions, but may also be uh, a big part of the problem. So next uh, slide, please. Um, the need to, to curb or fix unhealthy trajectories. When taking a closer look at the impact of current bioeconomy activities, which largely, which still largely consists of food activity, uh, food activities, we can see rather unhealthy trajectories. Um, yeah, I guess the main um, uh, points at this slide are, are, are widely known. Huh? The fo global food systems contribute a, a large share in global greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, bioeconomy is associated with excessive nitrogen and phosphorus fertilization, especially in high income societies, in industrial systems. Um, the, the EU bioeconomy is an impart, important, has shown to be an important driver of land use change and related biodiversity loss in distant ecosystems, uh, especially in tropical and subtropical countries. Um, at, the, at the social or, or actually the health side, human health is threatened by overconsumption and non-communicable diseases, um, which is also partly, uh, largely related to uh, uh, food patterns. Um, Abundant uh, food supplies contribute to food waste, which has a, also a considerable environmental footprint. Uh, and in many re regions, this has also come out uh, yet in, um, in the, uh, during the COVID crisis, both in low and high income countries, farmers are among the lowest income groups and the number of food and agri supply chains are associated with poor, uh, often migrant worker, worker conditions. So to conclude uh, this, this short overview is that there is a, a, an urgent need also to curb um, unhealthy trajectories, food consumption patterns and behavior in particular related to animal-based production and consumption systems 
as um, yeah, these unhealthy trajectories, curbing them is an important enabler or disabler if we don't manage to uh, for other um, strategies in the bioeconomy, including nature-based solutions. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, how to uh, understand bioeconomy then as, as both being a problem and a solution for health and well-being. Be, well an answer can be found in the holistic ontological framework of coupled social ecological systems. Um, this is a framework largely developed by ecologists and, and social scientists, in particular uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Um, yeah, basically you can see this red circle representing the social subsystem and the green circle, the ecological subsystem. And the middle darker red part is then basically the, the appropriation of natural resources that social, that societies need to fulfill their needs in particular for human health and, uh, and well-being. Um, the, the coupled social ecological system perspective takes humans as fundamentally dependent on the provision of ecosystem services, whereas this, at the same time, uh, they are a major shaping force in the habitats functioning and survival rates uh, of non-human uh, life. So this um, points at the complexity that we have, especially uh, taking into account the fact that social hierarchies, uh, have, uh, the way the societies are structured, you can see on the left side, are different than um, the, the structure, the hierarchy of ecological systems, which goes from organism to biosphere. So this concept, which is really rich and I think gives a different perspective, also points at the need for, for new governance structures and, and also the high governance challenges related to developing sustainable bioeconomy pathways. Next slide, please. So when we consider bioeconomy as kind of the economic set, this darker red part uh, of coupled social ecological systems, how then can it promote health and well-being of both human and non-human species? Um, yeah, you could see there are similarities in physical needs among human and non-human species. Um, human well-being, though, has been defined as a mental and physical state where all fundamental human needs are satisfied. This is in line with the work of Max Neff, for example. Um, so we took this approach in workshops in, uh, at the regional level in Austria, where we asked stakeholders to develop needs-based bioeconomy strategies. Not, and there it turned out that uh, bioeconomy was not only important for the fulfillment of subsistence needs, such as food, medicines, shelter, housing, and energy, but it was also mainly recognized for being a major economic activity in terms of work, income, uh, creativity, uh, uh, protection strategies, and, and in particular cooperation uh, with others, with other stakeholders, among stakeholders. Therefore, we conclude that a sustainable and resilient bioeconomy needs to promote work conditions that support workers' awareness, autonomy, freedom, if you like, and actions towards care, protection, and restoration of both human and non-human health. Um, both for unpaid and uh, for paid and unpaid work, such as cooking a nutritious meal, that is also already kind of an economic activity that has an impact on health, human and on human health. So we have called this the, the importance of meaningful work. Next slide, please. Which is already also the last slide. Uh, if you take these three aspects of a of a innovative sustainable bioeconomy pathway, human health, meaningful work and ecosystem health. Um, uh, if you want to translate that into innovative bioeconomy pathways, um, yeah, this is still work in progress, but what we see um, basically from a high income society perspective is a spatial distinction in bioeconomy pathways. Um, the first uh, column, is what you could call the global supply chain perspective um, uh, and is actually enhancing or building on the current market-based bioeconomy where, for example, bioplastics from sugarcane from Thailand is imported in the EU where it is used to produce, for example, biodegradable coffee pads for coffee from Ethiopia, which can then after use be composted, fully composted and used as a fertilizer uh, on European soils. 
uh, one can see that it does address societal problems, uh, in particular waste, um, and also uh, the use of fertilizers. Um, it contributes to human and non-human health in the EU, but still, um, yeah, there, there may be problems in the field of work condition and, and ecosystem health in distant countries, which are not easily solved, mainly as a result of competitive markets and margin erosion in, in global trade. Um, then the second column is a sort of opposite response, um, which are local bioeconomies that leverage or try to leverage on Keynesian income multipliers in regional money and resource systems. Um, as compared to the global supply chain, people tend to attach higher value to the quality of proximate ecosystems in the living environment. That's also increasingly supported by research that people tend to attach higher values to and that the distance towards ecosystems play in, plays an important role. Um, an example of this is the growing number of cities developing food strategies that connect the city to its proximate hinterland. Um, where they also take care of sufficient green space at the urban rural fringe. However, yeah, lo uh, local ecosystems show to lack um, financial resources to invest in technical innovations. And they, uh, as, as also Francis mentioned, they may be prone to, to supply shocks or to climate effects of shocks in local or regional supply. Therefore, um, yeah, um, a potentially interesting option is an, is an interregional cooperation, an interregional structure where regions more structurally cooperate towards integrated demand and supply solutions. This structure is likely to have advantages with respect to the management of the shared resource system, to funding for so social and technical innovations as markets are larger, and to protect ecosystems in a more integrated manner. For example, with a focus on, on larger biodiversity habitats and nature-based solutions for climate change. As a final remark, though, uh, I want to stress that it is important for all bioeconomy pathways to focus on healthy and sustainable consumption patterns with lower environmental uh, footprints, as this remains the biggest key, at least in developed or high income societies, towards restoring and promoting health and well being for both human and non human life in a sustainable bioeconomy. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Elizabeth. I think fascinating with this uh, local to global um, sort of uh, paradox that you started to lay out there. And maybe uh, that's one of the ideas in our workshop is can regional cooperation be some mediator between the local and the global? I think we are coming back to that. So I'd like to invite Tatian uh, and I invite people to uh, add to the chat we, since we started uh, a little bit late, um, questions probably mainly through through the chat. Uh, so, uh, Tatiana, I'd like to invite you to um, uh, speak about this interesting project on plant and uh, extracts uh, for malaria prevention in, in Eastern Africa. Uh, go, go ahead, Tatiana. Okay, thank you, Francis. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tatiana Masharaba. I work for the University of Burundi. Uh, for our project, uh, the bioinnovation is related to public health in its relation to business while contributing in achievement in the achievement of the SDGs and the, the African Union Agenda 2063 and uh, other uh, related regional development strategies uh, such as uh, the Eastern Africa uh, regional bioeconomy strategy uh, launched uh, last month. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, malaria uh, is a critical public health issue in the tropics. And uh, because of the limitations of malaria drug treatment to the ever-growing resistance of the parasites to the molecules uh, developed by the pharmaceutical industry, measures of prevention are still necessary and uh, crucial. Uh, besides the mosquito net widely used, uh, application of chosen plant extracts have proven to be one of the most uh, effective measures for prevention when applied. Uh, 
as you know, African biological diversity contains plant species that are found to be uh, effective. And in that context, one of the most effective plant species considered for uh, malaria prevention is catnip, which is in the Petakataria. Uh, it, is, uh, effective, it is an effective replant with, with its essential oil. So our project deals with uh, the production, the processing, and the, the marketing of catnip products to prevent malaria in Eastern Africa. We have uh, four partners, two partners in Burundi. I mean the University of Burundi, which is a public uh, academic institution and uh, carry the products, a private initiative. Other partners are from Tanzania. We have a teacher in Tanzania specialized in communication and uh, advertising. We have also a good laser farm we, which is specialized in farming and uh, in marketing. So we are very grateful for the support from Bioinnovate Africa and uh, the Swedish International Development Agency. Okay, next slide. What about the main objective of our project? Our, the main objective is to provide affordable plant-based mosquito repellent. We intend to produce uh, soaps, sprays, and lotions. We have a set of uh, outputs ranging from the product from reformulation, the efficacy test, manuscript, market analysis, business modeling, the contracted farmer, market share analysis, prototyping, and of course, uh, uh, management and uh, reporting. Next. Yeah, in concluding our project, we harness locally available resources to produce value-added malaria plant products that are environmentally friendly uh, and thereby contributing to malaria prevention in our region. And in so doing, uh, we do hope that uh, a number of opportunities uh, will be built at uh, local or regional uh, level. Uh, uh, by job creation. I thank you. Yeah, th thank, uh, thanks a lot, Tatian. Um, it's a, it's an innovative, uh, innovative project and a very serious uh, issue in uh, African context. Thanks. Um, now, uh, I'd like to ask um, Martina and Lena. They're going to make a brief. Uh, intervention uh, about uh, a research design for um, uh, a project they are uh, developing and it's uh, about sustainable bio-based innovation system for health and well-being uh, comparing between a case in uh, Africa and Latin America. Um, I'm not sure who is going to go first. I, I will. Ah, okay, yeah, go, go right okay. ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Francis, and good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, as Francis mentioned, uh, Martina, my fellow um, intern, and myself, we are both interns in the Governing Bioeconomy Pathways, and as an academic exercise uh, during the internship, we are exploring the potential for bio-based innovation. So please continue. So uh, basically the motivation for uh, our work is that both Latin America and Africa, they present a very unique confluence, you can say, of uh, high biodiversity regions, regions with a lot of, of species and, and diversity of functional ecosystems, and as well as a high degree of biocultural diversity. So local communities and rural communities uh, especially uh, have been in contact with this rich biodiversity for a very long time and uh, they have developed very valuable traditional ecological knowledge. So again, against this background, uh, we would like to uh, understand what's the potential for, this, for the integration of this traditional knowledge with more uh, biosciences or modern biosciences approaches to develop um, uh, innovation systems for health and well-being based on bioresources. So we want to characterize the innovation system for health and well-being uh, bioproducts uh, in both regions. And for this specifically, what we plan to do is we want to situate what 
what entails bioinnovations for health uh, in relation to traditional knowledge within other existing innovation types uh, and using also uh, integrating it with one health criteria so that we can really understand how to create these, uh, these pathways with uh, our, our perspective of human and non-human health. We want for this to develop a framework to characterize uh, bio-based innovation systems and um, while also integrating different uh, stages of innovation development derived from the already established 3D model uh, in health innovation. We want to identify who are the most important uh, type of actors, who are the actors, and what are the formal and informal networks involved in health and well-being. And we would like to finally apply the framework to analyze innovation systems for specific bioresources in Africa and Latin America. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, so um, here I'm just, go um, thank you, Lina. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a quick uh, summary of our research design. Uh, first, we would like to start by characterizing innovation uh, and we will do that by trying to find the similarities and dissimilarities between bio-based innovation in the health and well-being sector with uh, the One Health criteria and with also a different definition of other type of innovation like green, sustainable and inclusive innovations. Uh, after we characterize and define innovation, we will take this innovation and try to integrate it in a 3D innovation cycle, which is the innovation model developed by um, the World Health Organization for the pharmaceutical sector, but we will do so by adapting uh, the model to the case of uh, health and well-being innovation uh, using traditional knowledge. Uh, and also uh, using the innovation system that could include informal actors as well as formal actors. Next slide, please. Uh, so our case that we're uh, choosing for uh, the, uh, the Africa region is catnip, um, which is uh, the case uh, presented by Professor Tatian. Hopefully we'll be collaborating together with them to be able to uh, uh, finish our work. Uh, catnip, as he mentioned, uh, is used uh, to extract a, compon a component that works as a repellent for uh, malaria mosquitoes. And uh, it, hopefully it's a very uh, promising um, uh, plant uh, that could help uh, to reduce malaria around the region. Lina, to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, no, and for Latin America, uh, we are planning uh, to explore two potential uh, case studies of bioresources. One is uh, Asai, Euterpe Oleracea, which is an uh, already established uh, or well-known bioresource uh, with lots of potential for health and uh, in, with a very well-developed uh, value chain. And nowadays it's, it's very easy to, to find different products derived from this plant. So we would like, since it is already an, an established product that uh, for which a lot of information is known, we would like to apply it to the framework and, and understand how does it play within wider innovation um, framework and one health criteria. And also we want to explore a more uh, novel bioresource that is Andean DVDV. Uh, it is a plant that <clears throat> is distributed in the dry forests of uh, countries in Latin America, especially Northern South America. And, um, and it has uh, been reported to have lots of potential for uh, cancer treatments and there are already some uh, academic and tech spin-offs who would uh, are, are motivated to pursue their, their benefits. So it's also a, an interesting potential bioresource to contextualize in, in our bio, in our innovation uh, framework. So that's, that's uh, our internship project for now. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martina and uh, Lena. I think very interesting case and uh, hopefully some Maybe there are some participants who uh, uh, have some insights they'd like to, to share. So we, we are a bit late on the time, 
there have been some, a few a few questions. I think um, these were our general guiding questions. Um, and I want to come back. I think I saw a question from uh, Holger was asking about um, the uh, to what extent does human well-being and ecosystem health in taking the case of Austria, how might that depend on other re regions? The, how to negotiate the intra-regional trade-offs or no inter-regional, what are the entry points? Do you want to take that briefly, very briefly, Lisbeth? Uh, yes, uh, um, yeah, it's a very good question, also very difficult to answer. Um, what we saw in particular was that uh, rural regions and urban regions um, uh, tend to create um, conflicts or had there are trade trade-offs between them. Um, we could see that um, rural stakeholders uh, um, kind of work together to create gardens of Eden with regional bioeconomies where uh, lots of fossil products can be potentially replaced by uh, bio-based resources and kind of uh, um, neglect the city where the, uh, where the majority of the population lives, whereas urban regions um, is kind of more managed by more dominant stakeholders, uh, in particular in the energy system, that sees rural areas as kind of a resource base from which to source uh, bio-based resources that can be used in uh, the transition of energy systems, in particular that came out of our workshops. And so there are kind of potential um, conflicts there uh, pointing at the need for yeah, political processes and basically also a normative approach to, to what society uh, actually wants with a bioeconomy. And I think um, it's not up to me to answer that. It's not really my, my field, but yeah, there is definitely a, a big agenda there that uh, needs to be worked on, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um... There are a couple of other issues coming up in the chat. I don't know, um, Nella, if you, we have a few minutes left. Do you, do you want to take one of these, uh, uh, offer one of these, or uh, what do you think? It's also related to, to what Elizabeth just mentioned. I, I think that in the case of, for example, Latin America, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on prioritizing those uh, biological resources that can be exported, in particular to uh, the European Union. And I was wondering, after seeing your uh, table, if you think that would compromise what we can also achieve in terms of decent work and innovation, which are also the, the questions that you posted when you focus more on, on a global uh, bioeconomy market. I don't know if you have some comments or insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's also a very uh, relevant question. Um, basically, um, taking this social ecological systems perspective and, and um, the conclusions that I, that I took from that is that you can see that the risks are mainly in global supply chains that focus on generating exchange value in commodity markets. So they are not really Mm, working on societal solutions. I mean, in the end, there is a product that provides some sort of a solution, but basically the main aim of those supply chains is then to generate exchange value. So they're not uh, directly targeting a society with a problem. And I think there is also the problem, uh, sorry, the solution that global supply chains can very well uh, work together towards uh, uh, societal problems in areas in regions in um, in the EU um, and and have a more in fact you get shorter supply chains with with less um, stakeholders or, or participants in between so that the distance between the workers and final users uh, does not become too long because then yeah I think important values such as worker conditions and um, ecosystem values also in, in for example, Latin America gets out of sight. So yeah, I think new technologies and, and more direct cooperation towards solutions is, uh, is there um, a promising pathway in the bioeconomy. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think it's um, fascinating. Oh, sorry, I was just going to come in on this value in exchange versus value in use, you know, which is, it's an, in a way, it's a classic uh, ecological economics um, perspective that uh, remains to be resolved, and the bioeconomy has some hope of, of resolving it in a way, and so I think that uh, uh, is an uh, interesting point. Um, we have unfortunately run uh, low on time, but maybe I can ask you, uh, uh, Nella, if you want to make some closing comments or hit another point. And maybe my question for Tatiana, just for, for um, closing it, um, if you can explain a little bit more about how you're balancing affordability with uh, internalizing the cost in terms of environment and social issues in the product that you are developing. You replied on the, on the text, but maybe you can elaborate a bit. Thank you. Are you able to come in on that, uh, Tatian? Hello. Yes. Okay. Now we can hear you. Great. Thanks. No, I didn't cut the. the I, I got a, a slight problem with the internet. You can can you repeat the question? Is it the first one? Yes, it's the same that it's on the on the on the text from me. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, in the, the question on how can nations and the region sustain harness the resources through value addition for improving health and the well-being, I think that it is important to associate local communities. You know, they have, uh, they hold the traditional knowledge and also have to deal with uh, benefit sharing. Uh, as you know, in some region, for example, in Eastern Africa, it is uh, a biodiversity hotspot and uh, because we, we have a big number of goods and services provided by ecosystem. So we have to take into account the ecological aspect, the ecological sustainability, and to see how to, to domesticate, for example, some flagship species with a particular interest in health and well-being. Here I think that we should focus, for example, on some vulnerable species we have also to promote the close uh, collaboration between um, academia and the industry in the aim of uh, promoting bio-based product manufacturing, leading also to job creation. And also we don't, we, uh, it is important to also to, 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 co to cooperate on educational program, on training because we need human resources well skilled able to manage uh, biodiversity and the uh, ecosystem sustainably thank you thanks thanks so much uh Tatian. i think that uh we have to <clears throat> close out now we're a little bit behind but it's not too bad um so this uh this room will turn over to the next session actually which is um a regional session <laughs> on asia <laughs> And um, uh, so thanks a lot for this. Das sind die gleichen uh, Räume jetzt. Uh, yeah, remember to, to mute, mute. Das sind die gleichen Räume, ne? So, so, so this uh, session will turn over yeah. to Asia now. Ich bin gerade rausgegangen. And uh, we'll take a one minute break and we hope that, uh, uh, that our colleagues in Bangkok can uh, hear okay. And der Chat ist zu, aber es ist der gleiche. Reminder to everyone to mute, mute their uh, phone. Er hat auch gerade gesagt, das wird jetzt uh, yeah, der Asia Raum. Uh, GBS 2020 team, could you mute your mute. microphone, please? Uh, you have to mute. So um, the Asia session then will start in just a minute. Uh, if you were wanting to go to a different region, then you would need um, to click uh, on the appropriate Zoom room, which would be uh, one is Africa, two Asia, that's the room we're in, and then three is EU OECD. So I think just one minute we'll be uh, starting on this session. How is your sound in Asia? Um, Hi, in testing Asia? the sound. Very Are good. Okay? The sound is good, yeah. You want to uh, test, okay, the, test the video test the also? Video. Yeah. Okay, can you see me? Very good, very good. Uh, we also have Dr. Peapot here. You can see him if you turn the... Hello, everybody. I'm Pipat. Uh, yes, very good. 
Um, we can't see him at the moment, but you'll, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, so let's, uh, we'll wait, let's see how many people are in the room before we, um, yeah. I think uh, I'll let you and Matthew decide when you wanna start. I think it should be, I think everyone who's coming will be here in a minute, I hope. So I'm gonna go off. Okay, thank you. Uh, while we're waiting, can you please type in your chat box what country you're currently in? So there are a number of us in Bangkok right now, and we're hoping very hard that we don't get stuck in traffic when we leave due to uh, current political things going on in the country. <laughs> Uh, so please type where you're from, and um, you should be in the right session if you're interested in Asia. And we have two great speakers from Thailand and Indonesia who will share quite different perspectives on the bioeconomy. So please don't be shy. We'd love to know what country you're currently located in. Hello from the Philippines. Hi. And Wahida's from Indonesia. She's in Brussels. All right. Um, we can give a few minutes, but I think, Matthew, you can start sharing the screen. The first speaker will be Dr. Peapot. Um, Hello to someone from Germany. So um, as a brief introduction, my name is Meida Zeao. Um, I am a researcher at SEI Asia, uh, based in Bangkok. I'm originally from Myanmar, um, and we don't have a very thriving bioeconomy, but we would very much like to hear from uh, Dr. Pipat in Thailand and Dr. Wahida uh, from Indonesia, who have very, very uh, strong and robust bioeconomies. Um, so uh, I'd like to first introduce you to Dr. Peapart. Dr. Peapart is an agricultural scientist. He has been a senior executive in many important positions in the Thai government and the business sector, including the sugar giant Midpon and PTT, a petrochemical company in Thailand. Um, he proposed the concept of the Thai bioeconomy or the biohub to the Thai government, and it has been on the national agenda since 2013. So now he is the honorary president of the Thai Bioplastic Industry Association. He's also on the committee of Thai Society of Sugar Cane Technologists and the Agricultural Expert Group of National Research Council of Thailand and a mentor to many projects, including our research project. So thank you and welcome Dr. Pipa. Thank you, May, uh, for your introduction. And hello, everybody. Uh, today, uh, I do not waste the time, and I would like to, to hear your comment and suggestion uh, for our future collaboration as well. Uh, for bioeconomy, the advantages of uh, bioeconomy, uh, there are two, two advantages. First thing is uh, we can reduce reduce environmental con uh, problem or because uh, right now we concern about the environment, including uh, natural resources as well. The secondly is uh, the the idea of sustainability. Bioeconomy will help us and improve uh, the way to do business. The uh, first thing is uh, I would like to share that uh, what uh, Thailand faced in in environmental uh, issue, uh, that is uh, greenhouse gas and climate change. Uh, during the last two years, we faced uh, the, the severe drought and caused a lot of uh, problems to reducing in all of uh, agricultural products and along with uh, waste management, especially uh, for, bio, uh, for plastic waste. Uh, unbelievable that uh, Thailand is the sixth 
countries uh, were dumped the plastic in, into the ocean that create a lot of uh, environmental issue. Uh, that's why we would like to reduce uh, this uh, problem. And secondly, about the sustainability, when we talk about sustainability, we will focus on three dimensions. One is society, which is uh, uh, livelihood of our uh, population, uh, including equality of uh, our uh, Thai, population, uh, Thai people or Thai population. Uh, in terms of economics, uh, since Thailand is uh, an agricultural uh, country, we export a lot of food uh, to the global. And when we talk about food, uh, we will talk about uh, in terms of uh, not just only quality. Uh, for export, uh, we do not concern a lot, but uh, what we would like to focus now is in terms of uh, quality and also standard. If you focus, if you focus uh, on quantity, uh, quality and standard, it means that it will be good for health, uh, not just only for Thai people, but for the, uh, for the global as well. Uh, I would like to focus on uh, what is uh, next, please. Uh, our ultimate goals for doing uh, bioeconomy is uh, we would like to increase income per capita and reduce and inequality. Uh, in this case, uh, we actually uh, focus on agricultural products uh, because if we can increase uh, the value uh, in holistic picture, it means that it will contribute to the, uh, the, ma the majority of uh, our population in agricultural sector, which is now around 40% uh, of total population will be in uh, agricultural sector. And secondly, it's improved uh, food security index. Uh, actually, I do not uh, focus on index so much, but food security is mean, as I told you that, uh, not just only in Thailand, but uh, uh, in the global as well, uh, global level as well, standard and quantity. Uh, if I focus more specific, it's like a functional and healthy food for all of the people around the world. Uh, the third is uh, reduce and utilization of resources. It's, uh, uh, it will make us uh, more sustained in, in doing some business. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, will, we, will, we will lose a lot of uh, resources in the near future. Uh, the fourth one is uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission that uh, will affect us uh, globally as well. Next, please. I would like to focus uh, what sector of uh, or categories of bioeconomies business we are doing now in Thailand and also in the future. The first one is uh, bioenergy, uh, especially biofuel. Right now, we start uh, more than 10 years ago. We produce ethanol using uh, molasses from sugar industry as a raw material along with uh, starch or tapioca uh, to produce uh, ethanol and mix uh, with uh, fossil oil uh, as a, using as, as a gas hall in different uh, formula. Uh, it is clear that uh, we can reduce uh, some, uh, some CO2 uh, and air pollution in Thailand is less and less. Uh, we can feel that uh, actually. Uh, second is uh, actually we, we do have uh, biofuel from oil palm as well, be, be what, uh, uh, biodiesel, but uh, that is uh, not so much. The second we are doing now is um, biomaterial and biochemicals. Right now we do have uh, at least two bioplastic uh, lacing producer, which is a PLA. You may know that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bioplastic. The second is PBS type. The, these two types is the majority of bioplastic uh, in the world now. And others biochemicals, uh, right, uh, lactic acid, uh, using for food and pharmaceutical and others, uh, sugar, alcohol. Uh, this bioplastic and biomaterial we are using now uh, starch and sugar 
which are uh, exported uh, uh, commodity uh, to, to uh, in the second and the, the first the first rank, and the next two is functional food and animal feeding. Uh, you may know that uh, we are one of the important uh, countries uh, where produce uh, poultry and also some meat uh, and export to, especially in ASEAN. And functional food, uh, we 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 are focusing this year now more health, uh, more healthy and more functional to use as a supplementary. And in the near future, we will focus on biomedical as uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker talking about since we have a lot of uh, herbs and we can extract uh, as a medical or supplementary. But however, uh, bioeconomy is business is not easy uh, in terms of uh, production costs normally will be normally will will be higher than a conventional one like a bioplastic uh, products uh, it might uh, more expensive than one times uh, i would say that uh, one or two times but we can reduce and we can produce according to the innovation and technology uh, we can but still more expensive at least 50 percent that we have to develop uh, innovation and technology as well uh, in this case i would say that uh, the driver next slide please you can see that uh, actually we learn a lot from european uh, continental and also american uh, continental how to drive and how to push uh, bioeconomy success in Thailand. Uh, right now, we have uh, at least uh, a few dri key drivers. One is uh, government policy. Right now, Thai government uh, focus on, uh, let's say, biochemicals and uh, let's say bioeconomies uh, as a one policy connected uh, to agriculture and food because we 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 use a lot of uh, agricultural products and uh, they 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 have uh, i mean uh, thai government have many measurements uh, to support uh, either domestic investment and then also uh, foreign investment in thailand we have uh, a lot of measurement and privilege for that uh, kind of uh, bio economy investment the secondly is ppp meaning uh, private, uh, public and private uh, partnership. We have uh, a lot of uh, private company sign MOU to working to develop and also investment in Thailand. Uh, these private companies are foreigner and and also uh, local Thai company. The big company like uh, Peto, the biggest uh, petrochemical uh, company in Thailand, PTT, and also uh, Cement. Uh, they are they are producing uh, material for packaging as well. Now they turn and focus on bio packaging. The third one is bi biomass availability. Uh, right now we do have uh, export. Uh, we, are, we are the first rank uh, of cassava export in terms of starch and, and cassava chip which can divert, uh, which can, can be divert to starch using as a raw material uh, for producing any kind of uh, bio products like uh, biomaterial, biochemicals. Uh, the second one is uh, sugar. As you may know that we are the second larger exporter uh, in the world. Uh, actually, if we, we, in Asia, we are number one, but in the world, we are second after, uh, after Brazil. This biomass availability uh, if we can add it some value, not just only uh, exporting as, as a primary products or commodity products, we can add it value to the secondary or tertiary, like uh, biolacin or other chemicals or other uh, functional food. It means that uh, we can get uh, uh, the revenue more not just only for the countries, but also for the farmers as well. The most, the more important is R&D and technology. In this case, I would say that uh, Thailand 
try to create facilitates facilities for not just only for uh, Thai people but also for for the foreigner as well. We do have uh, uh, EECI, meaning Eastern Economics uh, Corridor of uh, Innovation. This uh, center we will collaborate. We will collaborate with the foreign countries, foreigners around the world, and also try to develop uh, our own technology or including technology lo localization from uh, our neighboring countries or foreign country as well. The most important for the bioeconomy is uh, marketing and lo logistic because uh, bio products itself is already expensive. We have, we have to try to reduce cost then uh, in terms of market and logistic, we have to have uh, facilities or let's say more than that is uh, we have to be close to the market. I would say that we cannot or we may not be able to compete with the uh, American continental area, but uh, in terms of European uh, area or even in especially, not even, especially in Asia, in Asia, uh, economic growth uh, will be more and more or higher and higher. It will be good for the future market. And in terms of load logistic, it, uh, Thailand can take advantage. Uh, all of uh, five key drivers, uh, not just only for Thailand itself, I think collaboration uh, from others region uh, really welcome. And, and I would say that uh, I am ready and willing to coordinate with uh, all of the world, with you all around the world. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm waiting for comment and suggestions for bioeconomy in Thailand. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Peapot. I think Thailand has a very, very detailed and um, strategic strategy. So um, let's go to Indonesia for now and see what they're thinking from their end. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wahida Magrabi. Dr. Wahida is the agricultural attache to the Kingdom of Belgium at the mission to Indonesia uh, for the European Union. Her role is to promote collaboration networks in food and agriculture sector through bilateral and regional platforms of the EU and its member countries. She has previously worked at the Indonesian Center for Agricultural Research and Policy Studies and fostered research collaboration between Indonesia and Australia through several, several ACIAR projects. So before we, uh, there's a picture of Wahida. So hi Wahida, we would like to show you a video first. Please me, thank you. Good morning everyone from Brussels. <laughs> All right. Ada di wilayah kita. Let me introduce uh, Baroka to Sukafila, then NTC, uh, in 2017, and since then, the collaboration between the two 
become stronger and mutual trust are earned. We've been buying coffee from Koparasi Kerinci Baroka since 2017. I could tell that they were willing to work very closely with us. The, the biggest strength in the quality that it has right now is that it can surprise people. We put coffees in front of roasters that are, that are not familiar with Indonesian coffees, and they're just super surprised. And then we tell them these are from Indonesia, and, and they're very, they're, they're impressed. So together with Sukafina Specialty, uh, the NGO Rekonto Indonesia and the Baroka Cooperative, we are starting a fundraising campaign to plant shade trees, more specifically avocado trees. Model bisnis seperti ini juga sejalan dengan kebijakan Uni Eropa yang semakin hijau dan sangat memperhatikan aspek traceability dan sustainability dari komoditas yang dipasarkan di Uni Eropa. Besar harapan kami, Model bisnis seperti ini dapat diduplikasi di sentra-sentra produksi kopi lainnya di tanah air. Tentu saja dengan memperhatikan kesesuaian agroekosistem, lahan, dan faktor-faktor lainnya di sentra produksi tersebut. Salam dari Kerinci, salam dari Merah! Thank you, Mai. Go ahead, Wahida. Yes, I think, you know, I'm waiting for the, yeah, okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, good morning from Brussels. Good afternoon in Bangkok and also, you know, for the Nada region. I think, you know, I'm very lucky at the beginning, Lisbeth has mentioned about uh, the, the, you know, the relation between health, well-being and environment. Actually, you know, the video really shows what's gonna be happen in the near future about how the EU will be sourcing uh, our commodities, the commodities from third country like Indonesia to be able to enter in the European market. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna starting my presentation by highlighting the issue of deforestation. I think everyone at the EU at the moment are really familiar with the European Green Deal. This is like a new ambition coming from the European presidents. It's got the very fully support coming from the Commission, the Parliament, as well as the EU Council. So the new regulation is really make the EU into the new Europe in the 2050. And then what's gonna be impacted to our country, in particular Indonesia as the main sources of, as the producer of the coffee. With the deforestation, the EU believes that the main driver of deforestation is the agricultural land. So then uh, there is eight, eight commodities will be concluded at the moment with the current European report uh, that halt the forestation to the forest as well. It's gonna mention that there is eight commodities that relate with uh, deforestation. And they name the product as the forest and ecosystem risk commodities. So with the, this kind of report, the EU, in particular, the, uh, the commission will investigate the supply chain transparency and the regulation itself will be, pro, uh, will be, uh, will be, uh, will be <laughs> developed next year and then in the second quarter of the 2021. Next slide, please. Actually, you know, this is how Indonesia will gonna tackle the EU current force policy and then five priorities. I'm just gonna emphasize the number three, the empowering international cooperation to fight deforestation and forest degradation. Why? Because this is very important for Indonesia and as well as, you know, other country who gonna import uh, export the product to the EU. We really looking forward, we really look the room for collaboration, how the country like us not being excluded from the EU market because of the EU regulation. The question is, because you know, the main, uh, the first impact will be in, uh, affected the farmers, the small holders. We're talking about the small holder in the third country like us, the small holders with the very small, small land size compared to the EU. So I think this is the room for collaboration that I could emphasize since the uh, European Green Deal is just starting. So I think this is our, uh, I think, fora, how the uh, developed develop country like the EU able to communicate, able to working together with their suppliers from third country like Indonesia. Next slide, please. 
Besides the forest regulation, uh, the Indonesia also has to face about the farm to fork strategy, which is the EU really uh, put concern about the pesticide as well as the nutrients and also the organic farming become like the room for uh, the another room for a new aspect, uh, uh, market access for the Indonesian product to the EU. I think we are really looking forward the opportunity for this. And with regard to all this kind of uh, regulation that gonna, uh, uh, that EU put in place, then the farmers will be facing what we call as the certification because this is the only tools and measurement that can uh, guarantee to the consumer that the product that has been marketed to the EU starting next year will not consider uh, will co consider as deforestation free supply chains and the farmers has the one who should battle or face the battle on this so next slide please i think i have mentioned about this this is the video uh, may i can just go to the next slide to the take home messages just to make it shorten Okay, so I just highlighting fourth uh, take home messages for everyone here. You know, I'm expecting, you know, many uh, participants coming to the Europe will gonna share this, the take home message uh, that coming from Indonesian perspective. The first one, it is important to highlight that smallholders are inclusive to the deforestation free supply chains. I really would like to emphasize and stress about these particular uh, points to the EU. Why? Because it's really affected all the EU regulation will impact, uh, will affect it directly to our farmers. We, so we also really looking forward to have a, dev, a joint efforts in developing the measurement. We really would like to see the certification, which is, as everyone knows, is very costly and it's very tedious in terms of the uh, paper and et cetera. So this is the room that maybe we could collaborate. We need to find something that more simple, but still convince uh, the consumer at the EU, uh, I mean, on the EU. The third one, Indonesia also, whether like it or not, if Indonesia still thinking EU is one of the biggest, um, our trading partner, then we need to develop a roadmap. And then we need the collaboration from the EU in particular. Why? Because, you know, when you develop the regulation and at the, in each, I mean, if you see the regulation, there is a lot of word mentioned talking about the collaboration, using the words of collaboration. So we really would like to see how we can collaborate together. And then the last one, and also you know, is the conclusion for the video that you just showed. The direct sourcing will be a trending business model. And this is the, also you know, the need from the government in particular, from the Indonesian government, to really strengthen what we call as the cooperation. The cooperative of the farmers, smallholders farmers in the uh, coffee area. It's not gonna be only for the coffee, but as well as for the rubber and cacao. Uh, there, are, there are different story with the palm oil, but I think those four commodities will be affected starting next year to the EU market. That's coming from me, May. Hopefully it's, I made the time. You did make the time. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. Uh, so actually before I go to my own questions and the audience questions, um, actually audience, please free, feel free to pose your questions um, in the chat box. Um, I'm very interested in uh, having the uh, two speakers ask questions to each other because um, it seems that these business models that you're employing, one in Thailand with the uh, special economic zones, the ECI, seems quite different from the direct smallholder model that supply chain model that Indonesia is employing. So can I ask you guys to ask any questions to each other if you have any before we go on to my questions? Thanks. Dr. Pipat, please. Yeah, uh, thin, uh, the size of, of, of farm size in Indonesia is very small. Uh, I would like to ask you how about the uh, cooperatives uh, method or how about the cooperative, cooperative system in, in Indonesia? I think it will help uh, the farmers to consolidate, consolidate and, and consolidate some equipment or some technology to help each other, including a marketing system as well. That is uh, what we are doing in Thailand. Thank you, Dr. Pipat. Actually, at the moment, this is our, uh, at the ministry, I mean, in the min on the Minister of Agriculture at the moment, it's become our first concern at the moment, because, you know, to sourcing the product, especially with the higher requirement, like the EU standard, it is impossible for the farmers to do it by themselves. 
they need to collaborate in one cooperative. So the example that I showed to you is the cooperative. So we really would like to kind of like copying the, this particular business model, which is the coffee to the Europe is directly sourcing coming from the cooperative. We need to duplicate the model, but for sure, you know, every coffee area will have different kind of agroclimatic zone as well as, you know, the, the condition of the farmers itself. So we really would like to strengthen the local condition of each farmers and then, you know, consolidate them to the cooperative. And then we expect the market itself, the trading is goes not by individual, but coming from the cooperative. Even our ministry thinking a bit larger than this, they really would like to make a corporation, which is they try to make this cooperative together, make, you know, some cooperative into one corporation. And, you know, we have more business oriented scheme, Dr. Pipat. So they're thinking to start doing this. We start by the food crops commodity first, maybe the estate crops like the coffee or spices or other commodity will be joined later. Yeah, thank you. So Dr. Pipat, I would like to ask to you, I think, you know, your presentation is very interesting. So this is pure private sectors or is there any government uh, collaboration with your project and also in your company? Uh, government will facilitate in terms of uh, investment uh, measurements. Otherwise, uh, uh, collaboration, co collaboration uh, will be among the private. And the secondly is, uh, uh, as I told you, that investment, but uh, for R&D, uh, the government will involve in some, in, some, in some activities. How many companies like you just, I mean, like your company, has been operated in in Thailand. You know how many percentage. You know, I mean, how many how many how many company that has been doing this. You know, put the bioeconomy uh, into their principles. It depends on which which part of the bioeconomy. For example, uh, bioplastic. Uh, it will be consists of uh, upstream, uh, midstream business, and 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 downstream business. Uh, for instance. Uh, uh, for packaging, uh, we have more than 20 or 30 uh, SME size companies involved in, 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 in this business. But for, for the upstream, like uh, bioplastic resin, there will be just only a few big companies because uh, we need high technology and high investment costs. For example, not less than 200 or 300 uh, million US dollar for one factories. Mm -hmm. But for packaging, uh, you, can, you can invest in, in the small or medium size uh, for converting uh, or producing some packaging. Thank you, Dr. Pipat. Back to you, May. Okay, thank you. Um, you're asking questions to each other made my job much easier. <laughs> so, uh, Wahida, you actually mentioned that a joint effort is needed to um, overcome some of, some of the barriers that is imposed on us, us ASEAN countries because of these EU policies and strategies. So, can I get both of your ideas on what kind of cooperation really is necessary? What kind of cooperation is necessary for Indonesia and for ASEAN as a whole? And for Thailand, what kind of cooperation are you looking into? Um, and also, what other partnerships with ASEAN uh, do you think you could need? Dr. Pipat first? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Wahida, would you like to go first? Yes, okay, it's fine. Okay, May, so I think, you know, what kind of cooperation do we need? Uh, first, you know, we have been discussed, for example, for the coffee uh, here in Brussels, I engage closely with, they call it European Coffee Federation. So we really have, you know, the talking and the, uh, you know, build up the communication because we really also would like to see how the coffee producers here, the stakeholders, having the perspective on the EU regulation. Hang on, May. Bentar ya, Kak Ibu. Ibu lagi meeting, Kak. Bentar, Ibu telepon. Okay, so, so my daughter calling me. Okay, so I think we're talking, so uh, we have the collaboration with the EU Coffee Federation, with the EU Coffee Federation, 
to have a how to really mitigate the issues you know on the ground how the way that they see the perspective on this this is you know how uh, we really would like to collaborate so they're offering one of the example that the room for the collaboration is you know can we work together developing a good agriculture practices because you know the root of the very easy way to solve the problems at the moment is you know by implementing the good agriculture practices at the farmers level indonesia has the program but then we need to uh, push further about this program and then we have to have like kind of of the mapping how the implementation of good agriculture practices on the ground this is our homeworks and then the the, the ecf itself is already offering the collaborations this is the example how we're going to collaborate may and the other thing is you know in doing the certification there's another room because we know exactly majority the uh, business driven certification come from the eu so this is another room for collaboration that we expected the eu uh, could help us on this thank you may Actually, I do agree. But firstly, we, I think uh, we have to select, uh, 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 okay, let's say the majority and the, f the, the field that uh, we can collaborate is agriculture. And we have to go deep into the ground root, meaning the farmer's level. But first thing is we have to select which kind of crops we can collaborate because uh, each site uh, we do have uh, different uh, capability or advantages. For example, palm oil. We cannot compete with Indonesia. <laughs> then the way to do, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of production costs in average, uh, then we cannot compete with uh, Indonesia or even uh, uh, Malaysia. Then what we are doing palm oil is just only for create a job to the farmers in some region. But what you, ha you have to select uh, according to mm. the, your climate or, or inputs, which is uh, better than Thailand. I, I would like to talk a little bit in, 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 in some sample because I was two or three years working as an advisor in Indonesia, which is sugarcane. Mm. Because you have policy to create cane field or cane plantation in Indonesia, which is the, there are a lot of constraints, size, equipment, or even some, 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 some varieties. It's difficult to compete with Thailand, I would say. Then in this case, you should focus on import raw sugar and define it to, to the white sugar for consumption, for, for example. And in Thai, uh, Thailand can learn coffee and, and, and palm oil and rubber from you. I think in detail, like uh, cultural practices or uh, agricultural standards, we know already in detail, but we have to choose which kind of crop we can collaborate and which way. That's it. But normally, every government try to do everything, <laughs> which, which uh, you, 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 you have not to do everything, but you, you can select and we can change. Actually, at, at some personal level or university level, we do have collaborate. Collabor uh, collaboration already. I, I, uh, I have a lot of uh, Indonesian investors bringing to see the uh, sugar industry, but that, that is my, my point. Agreed, Dr. Fifat. I think we need to put priorities to each sector we can collaborate in the Asian as well as you know, between Asian and the EU. Okay, so um, actually time is up for us, um, but I would like to take an audience question, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, most of the questions seem to be from SEI. Uh, <laughs> would someone not from SEI <laughs> like to ask a question? Otherwise, I will ask, um, I'll select a question so that one of you can answer. So external audience, now is your chance to take over an SEI question. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so the questions we actually have right now, um, one is about um, how to stimulate new value added products, both for the domestic and export market. What do you think are strategies in Thailand or Indonesia? So you can choose that question if you like. The other question is um, about the disadvantages of bioplastics that bioplastics alone uh, cannot overcome some of the issues. And for example, it can contribute to ocean pollution um, and is not a perfect replacement for fossil-based uh, plastics. Do we need more life cycle analysis on bioplastics? Um, is there a solution that is from a Thai perspective or ASEAN perspective? So there are these two questions and I will let you choose one of them. So uh, would you like to go first, Dr. Peapot? Bio, bioplastics or value added products? For bioplastic, uh, I would like to focus on single use first because uh, in terms of volume, it's a lot. Uh, somebody talk about the medical uses, but uh, I think it's uh, it's it's cannot uh, that is not a big volume in terms of economy of scale. It's difficult to 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 uh, to produce uh, in a short term. Uh, actually, bio economy, uh, if we think just to concept, high value, you will use low volume of raw material. And if you use low, vol low volume of material, it means that uh, agricultural products volume will be less or not too much. It will not affect to the livelihood from the farmers. Uh, I think that you understand me. I would like to focus on biofuel. But in terms of biofuel, we have to be careful about the, the issue of deforestation. In Thailand, we, we have no problem, but in, in Indonesia, a little bit, I, I would say. But in Thailand, uh, we have to concern about environmental problem like uh, sugarcane burning or whatever, a little bit. But in terms of the others, we, I myself personally, I would like to push and support on Ethanol, ethanol or gasohol. Why? Because one million ton of sugar uh, of cane can produce. Oh no, one million lit of uh, ethanol will use around five million ton of sugar cane. It will take a lot of uh, value back to the farmers or down to the farmers. But just only thousand or ten thousand million ton of uh, sugar produce just only something, then it will not affect to the ma majority of the farmers that I would like to focus. But in terms of uh, marketing, in terms of bioplastic, just only single use. And another thing we 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 have to develop is mulching, mulching film from agriculture product. It will use not just only to reduce environmental after uh, planting, but also in terms of agricultural practices, reserve uh, soil moisture and, and prevent from, from weeding. It will help, but we need to study which kind of crop. Okay, Wahida, would you like to take over? Yes. I think I'm going to answer Francis' question, the first one, May. At the moment, you know, for the value-added products, it, is, it depends on the commodity, Francis. For another, you know, different kind of commodity in agri-product, it is very well happened in the country, in the domestic market. We have, you know, various uh, added value at the farmers. And the good, uh, the good thing at the moment, uh, we have young entrepreneur in the agri-sector, which is kind of like very promising. And due to the COVID itself, there is, you know, the online marketing for the agri commodities become booming. 
uh, that's the first one, that's the very prospective in the country. However, it's not really happened to the export market. Why? Because uh, majority of the Indonesian export to the EU at the moment is on uh, raw materials. So like, for example, the green, uh, the green bean for the coffee, as well as, you know, for another dried goods commodity. Because, you know, if we, uh, why? Because we, we are quite competitive in selling dried goods to the EU. We don't have a comp uh, competitive advantage and as well as comparative advantage for the fresh product. That's why, you know, at the moment, majority how the European market uh, operate is, you know, they put all the commodity into the storage. That's why having uh, raw materials is, you know, extend the shelf life of the, the product because before uh, the company or the industry put the product in the market. So we have to struggle to develop another value added products to the EU market, but I think we have to start doing towards that direction, uh, Francis. It's not easy, but then, but we have to start. Otherwise, we're gonna be known just as the exporting materials product, I mean, raw material product to the EU. Thank you, Mai. Yes. Okay, uh, one response from Dr. Pipa. Yeah, life cycle analysis of bi uh, on bioplastic uh, for the ocean pollution. Until now, we, we, we still have no real uh, study or publication exactly. But I think that this uh, will be the long concept that uh, we will innovate or try to solve the problem. But the best solution is not not throw away any plastic into the ocean. That is the best solution. If the best solution is uh, try to produce bioplastic, which uh, can, uh, can be degraded in the ocean, the people will not stop throwing into the ocean. I think uh, the behavior of, of, uh, of the, the people has to be improved rather than uh, try to find something can, can, can be degraded. In, Okay, so thank you very much uh, to our speakers for such a stimulating discussion and talking about uh, your countries and the impact of the different ASEAN region and EU politics on, on our region. Uh, we, just, we talked about different strategies that Thailand and Indonesia are taking. Um, some of it we discussed were smallholders and their involvement in the direct supply chain. The other that you discussed was public-private partnership. Uh, we also talked about the importance of selecting crops um, for collaboration, how you really have to focus on some key commodities that you want to drive into the market. And we also talked a little bit about the environmental trade-offs. We talked about efficiency and um, how that can maybe improve livelihoods and also add value uh, in the long run. And also for bioplastics, waste management um, is a very important uh, aspect and how bioeconomy products cannot be a perfect replacement for some of the environmental issues facing all of us. So thank you very much. Uh, I will now pass it over to Matthew, if you have any announcements, otherwise, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Mai. Thanks, thank friends. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.